Yes? I said, put your hands in the air, now. Are you robbing me? Yes. Oh. Rooster Teeth began with a dream. A dream of a bunch of slackers making silly short films on local Halo multiplayer. That dream begat Red vs. Blue, one of the first animated web series to really catch on, back when videos on the internet had no central distribution methods. And let's face it, the reason Red vs. Blue caught on so hugely was because of them riding the popularity wave of Halo in the early 2000s, but their own efforts and how legitimately funny and creative Red vs. Blue is being why they've lasted and their company grown over the years. I legitimately love Red vs. Blue, and look forward to what new direction they'll take things in. My only big criticism is how they keep going back to a box canyon scenario every few years only to satirize how much they don't want to go back to it. Which admittedly seems to be a case of, we are satirizing what a minority of fans want to show them why they shouldn't want that. As things only get interesting and creative and fun when they escape the limitations of the Box Canyon scenario as it's been done to death by them already. That's where the magic of when they've gone back to it happens. As two teams out in the middle of nowhere? whoop de fucking do Honestly, I'm excited to see what Rooster Teeth does next, as with how much the crew has branched out over the years, they're probably the best and most diverse web-based entertainment business out there. They're... Honestly, the goalpost to a lot of us that do web video stuff, able to do what they love and enjoy as their actual job, with a staff of people who all get along. What a lovable collection of bickering morons. You know, back when we worked on Red vs. Blue, we actually gave a shit. Isn't that right, Jeff? I don't remember. And after they had a hit, Rooster Teeth began diversifying their content library with Achievement Hunter and the Rooster Teeth shorts as early as 2007, and eventually gained series like Nomad of Nowhere, Camp Camp, Immersion, Genlock, the various live miniseries, and even films with Laser Team. 16 years on, and Rooster Teeth shows no sign of stopping. However, I can probably pin down where, as an audience member, I realized that they were not going away anytime soon. Red vs. Blue's eighth season, after the prior to it taking the series a level in storytelling, likewise upped the ante by entirely breaking the limitations of machinima, the use of existing game assets to create your animations as they had done up to that point, in and of itself. And these original action sequences and models were made possible by one man, Monty Ohm. Ohm himself has his origins as an animator on YouTube coming to initial fame and appreciation early in the platform's life with his Dead Fantasy series, and the first project of his that I saw, Haloid, a fan film of a team-up of a Halo Spartan and the indomitable Samus Oran. Him coming onto the Rooster Teeth team was a result of him and RT's head, Bernie Burns, meeting at a convention, Bernie knowing of his reputation for animation because of Haloid, and being curious on whether he could do the same for their production. Ohm had signed on to a few game companies for work on them after the Haloid video, but found the work stifling, so RT seemed a better fit. And because of this, it allowed them to shore up the one area where Red vs. Blue was lacking. For a series that took place in a setting where all these military forces existed, and with them now out of the box of the Box Canyon, well, they needed better action scenes, which their original animation now more than supplied, having created some fantastic sequences over the years. And with the 10th season's conclusion finished on schedule, Ohm submitted his proposal added to RT's library of content with his own fully original animated web series. Created in concert with Miles Luna, who had come up as a writer on Red vs. Blue and been part of its move from primary satire to then satirical drama, and who also served as season 11 through 13's head writer, and Kerry Shawcross, who'd been part of the company's editing team, they submitted and subsequently produced Ruby. With its first season, first volume, I use the two interchangeably, premiering alongside Red vs. Blue's 11th season in 2013. Ruby has since grown into an international sensation, with manga editions, a Japanese dub and played on Japanese stations, 
a spin-off super deformed series satirizing the show in shorts, and which is all impressive considering how well cringe-inducing the first season came off as. While a lot of people were on board with the idea, a magical girl series with the Buffy the Vampire Slayer twist to it set in an original fantasy world that inevitably drew conceptual ideas from Grimm's fairy tales, the first season had a lot of problems to it with regards to tone, pacing, and animation, all of which were to be expected. This was still pretty experimental for a web series, and while Ruby made many allusions to fantasy works and general anime tropes, it was trying to be an original take and have an original direction to its story. But with how things started out, it didn't seem that way for many, myself included as, well, we were in on the tropes, and resulting from Rooster Teeth's pedigree, we collectively had high expectations. I originally considered reviewing Ruby Volume 1 back in the middle of 2014, before Season 2 would have premiered. I, however, decided to delay doing so because I came to the realization that, well, a lot of good shows have a rough start, Red vs. Blue included, and I felt that maybe it would have been better to wait until after the second season to see where they were taking things. Monty Elm sadly passed away in February of 2015 due to an allergic reaction, cutting his involvement in the series short. It was because of this that I never ended up doing that review, as I felt it inappropriate and in bad taste to lob criticism just as its central creative force had died. I didn't want to stomp at his memory for the people who did enjoy the series, simply out of respect. Rooster Teeth has since kept the series going in his memory, with Miles and Carrie as its central creative staff for it due to them being its co-creators. This has drawn its own criticism towards the company, with fans saying they're defiling his work, and yeah, I know the feeling. I've certainly said that about other writers and producers who clearly show they don't respect anyone else's work, including those who would bastardize an original creator's ideology and intent just to assert their vision as better, only to veil disastrously. However, those that say that in this case, you didn't know Monty. You don't know what his plans for the series were. You don't know what he desired for its direction and intentions and ideology. And the series was too young, and almost body of work too short at the time of his death to glean that from what there was. Such takes more time than what he had. So if anyone did have an idea of what his vision was, it would have been them. And season 3 to 6 did more than enough to shore up the series, so it's legitimately successful, not on Rooster Teeth's reputation, but its own merit. Moreover, it's pretty clear his family gave their approval to them continuing, as Monty's brother Neith took his place in voicing the character Ren. Thus, if anything, the show now stands as a testament to the last remnants of his life. But it still doesn't change the series start out less than stellar, but with the benefit of hindsight, it no longer reads the same as it used to. It was clear that Ruby intended to go somewhere with all of this from its start, and the missing pieces would be seen and revealed in time instead of the creative staff making it up as they go along. The Rooster Teeth staff had admitted that they have at times done with Ruby what they did with Reverse is Blue, and expanded on their early zany elements and meaningful seeds of information that had been emphasized earlier. You... have silver eyes. For new plot developments. With RVB, it was to answer why things were so weird in Blood Gulch and give answers to the insanity they encountered not intending to fill plot holes and missing content, with more plot holes and missing content, as I would say of other series and creators. And thus, in contrast, it's easy to see how it all fits together now six seasons in with Ruby. So, I'm approaching this differently than I normally would. As, well, I know that the Ruby team addressed most of the big criticisms with time due to them actually listening to the feedback from fans. So, a first look at the show ends up being deceptive about its quality. I mean, no one looks at the first season of any Star Trek series and think that it stays that bad for the rest of each show, right? And as such, let me recap the story before breaking down what was wrong at the time, but has since been worked to be fixed. On the fantasy world of Remnants, the populace has since ages past been terrorized by bestial monsters known as the Grimm. But in time, sentient beings emerge and harness the powers of crystals known as dust to bring about magics and powers of great versatility and fought them off, forming the hunters which safeguard the kingdoms of the realm. Into the newest class of senior trainees in this profession comes the gunscythe-wielding Ruby Rose, 
given the chance to enter the exalted school of Beacon after being involved in stopping a heist from one of the society's biggest criminals. Which acts as a lead-in to her becoming involved in fighting a bigger conspiracy and greater machinations to devastate all civilization. Joining her at school is her elder sister, Yang Xiaolong, with puns to go along with her powerful punches. Heiress to the world's largest dust production company, Wei Shni, who fights with the rapier, energy constructs, and many, many canisters of dust. And lastly, Blake Belladonna, who's basically a ninja, and former equal rights protester who chose to give back after the organization she was part of turned terrorist, which plays a big part in how events of their society end up turning wrong. And when things go wrong, you're going to call Team Ruby. The second and supporting cast includes Team Juniper, whose arcs interweave with Team Ruby's, most intimately being that of John Arc and Pura Nikos, the former an untrained boy who snuck into the school with forged papers, and the latter a rising star of the Hunter world that is inevitably drawn to him for... reasons I never understood. However, the two, even early on, are adorable together, eventually developing for them to have true mutual affection, and almost having a relationship before... Nope! Nothing bad ever happened. John, however, graded on many as the novice who cheated his way into the presence of those who earned their right to be there. But in a surprising case, was shown that his own upbringing denied him the opportunity to develop into a capable warrior, as he quickly catches up with the others in terms of ability, if albeit him still remaining a doofus throughout. The other two teammates are Lee Ren and Nora Valkyrie, a pair of friends since childhood. Ren, a reserved martial arts badass with bladed dual guns, which personally just helped to sell for the years existing naysayers about Haseo's dual guns. I really love those guns. Well, Nora is... basically Pinkie Pie reined in by Ren, while Nora brings the introvert out of his shell. Among the supervising staff is the school's headmaster, Ozpen, who even early on gave off the feel of a calculating chess master moving pieces across the board to counteract those in a larger game with time. The villain faction of the series are split into two camps. First and foremost, the bestial Grimm, manifestations of soulless darkness the hunters are normally charged with fighting. And secondly, and more maliciously, the alliance of human criminal factions helmed by Roman Torchwick, a petty crook and arms merchant just out for himself, with his services made available just so he survives. Adam Taurus, the new head of the White Fang, Blake's former organization, which he has radicalized out of his own hatred for humanity due to the persecution he'd suffered at their hands. With a particular hatred for Weiss's father due to them enslaving members of their race, known as the Faunus, who are human-animal hybrids and Faunus having been treated as second-class citizens for millennia. And lastly is Cinder Fall, the true architect of the Mosh Nations everyone is drawn into in her own pursuit of power. The first season is split into four smaller arcs that set the status quo and focus on each of these characters in some respect in turn. The first introducing the cast to each other and ultimately having them form their teams and dynamics of interaction. The second dealing with Ruby's insecurities as both the youngest student at the school at 15, while well, everyone else is 17 or older, and also her being the elected leader of her team, along with Weiss's own social complexes resulting of her family life that rubbed everyone around her the wrong way. The third about John and how he faked his way into the school and Pura's efforts to make him earn the right to be there, as she doesn't want him to leave as she sees something special in him. And the fourth on Blake and her connection to the White Fang, and the revelation that she is in fact a Faunus, with her previous prominence in the White Fang coming into play as they act as the Pointman forces in alliance with Roman and Cinder in their ongoing machinations. Let's start with something that threw people for a loop initially. From the trailers Rooster Teeth showcased about the series, no one expected this to basically be Monster Hunter High School for Magical Girls. From the initial hype in Rooster Teeth's prior work, Many of us presumed that the four disparate main characters were going to encounter some big threat and unite to fight it or something along those lines. We were kind of right, but, well, not with the student angle. Though even it being Monster Hunter High School is a misnomer since everyone's late teens in age, making this all come more off as Monster Hunter College. But even then, a criticism I personally lobbed at the show originally is... Everyone bar Ren acts a lot younger than their chronological age, as if they were still awkward middle schoolers or freshmen in high school. Hell, everyone still refers to them as kids, even though at 17, they should be recognized as adults in this society. 
I know that's not a complaint considering the cast of Red vs. Blue endeared everyone by them acting like the immature jerks that show up in FPS PvP mode, but different setting, different rules, and these guys are training for the job of saving people in life or death situations. I've seen 10 year olds in series with a less inhospitable setting act with more maturity. I hate to agree with Weiss considering how bitchy she can be early on, but the decorum sells it all as if this isn't a big deal and this is the awkwardness that is high school, instead of the more clear-headed perspective required for college and even a few years age difference. Especially considering the arc that Ruby and company end up on beginning with the end of season 3 where Nothing bad ever happened. Ever. And a lot of the writing came off as, quite frankly, cliché as a result. How many series that aren't slice of life, but are more going for fantastical elements, or will involve monsters, have set themselves in high school? It's a long list and a lot of series. Power Rangers, Fate Stay Night, Yu Yu Hakusho, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, Rosario Plus Vampire, High School D Cross D, Kill la Kill, Nejima, Strange Times at Blake Holesley High, Kamara Force, Final Fantasy VIII, Code Lyoko, Code Geass, Most Magical Girl Anime, and that's just off the top of my head where it felt pretty heavily overtread material. To be perfectly honest, even before Monty Owen's death, the tonal disparity between world setting and the actions of the cast is why I actually dropped it after the second season. While yes, levity outside of serious situations is warranted, and it can provide contrast between immature people starting out their journey and travel towards mature endpoints, well, too much can leave a sour taste as it doesn't mix well with the other flavors you're adding in. I didn't originally watch Season 3 onwards before I was requested to review Season 1, because the sour note just kept me from wanting to come back simply out of apathy. When I did come back, though, that was mostly gone as the show had evolved into being what people first expected, and all it took was the fall of Sanctuary. To touch a bit on content past this season, Season 3 became an entire paradigm shift for the show's dynamic, continuing and concluding several arcs while beginning or laying the groundwork to new ones as a result of fallout from its events, much of which is steeped in tragedy. It made clear that the cast with this levity in the beginning was screwing around, was letting their egos and pride and childish belief in their own immortality because of how strong they already were get in the way of learning and improving themselves by properly training for the job. And most of them paid for it in some form or another, so afterwards they would be forced to grow up. Season 3 strongly felt as a loss of innocent story by its end, with it taking the following three years to deal with its fallout in its greater arc that has helped to evolve the cast and setting overall by leaps and bounds that ultimately makes this all feel more natural. Season 1 provides the groundwork. Season 2 expands context of the setting, more characters in the conspiracy. Season 3 reveals the purpose of said conspiracy and its role in taking one of their own. Season 4, the cast are broken and grasping for direction when they are forced to question themselves after experiencing the trauma of loss on multiple differing and diverse tiers. And with Season 5, them bringing the gang back together amidst new revelations about themselves. And the most recent Season 6 allows them to learn the true nature of the threat they thought they were fighting, and giving them resolution to some of the hardships they'd faced. I guess I can better contrast that with the Blood Gulch Chronicles antics against those of Season 6 through 13 of Red vs. Blue. In Blood Gulch, the Reds and Blues kept screwing around with their own petty squabbles, which were only briefly intersected upon by some other plot they didn't really care about, but was made interesting because it teased at something greater. Then Season 6 happened, and both the Reds and Blues were totally unprepared for what that something greater was. So they were left to stumble amidst the new paradigm. And in retrospect, it is unsurprising such a pattern would repeat. The animation of the first season was also very uneven. The body modeling is very good, but the movement of the models is pretty blocky outside of the fight scenes, which in contrast, of course, are excellent with their coherent narrative of events. And don't even get me started on the lip flapping, that's just... no. This, however, was a result of them using a new modeling program that took them time to get the handle of, Poser 2014. With experience, this hasn't been a problem since, and they even switched to a new program beginning with Season 4 called Autodesk Maya, which required them to rebuild the character models, 
which even further dealt with the issue and made it far easier to build intricate environments and other models and assets. And as a result, this took care of another issue. All of the shadow models that were used overwhelmingly for background characters, or otherwise environments that felt barren. Though I didn't think that was that big a deal at the start, as I understood it takes time to create CGI models, even the generic ones, and this later became a font of jokes in how only main characters actually had detail to them. And when the super deformed stuff showed up, well, I get they wanted to include anime cliches in this, but many of them felt really out of place, in part due to the modeling. It needed to be dialed back, and they were, ultimately being shoved off into the chibi segments of the off-season. Another significant problem initially was pacing. Multiple single episodes of the series were split into two parters, something still showcased on the YouTube and Rooster Teeth website releases of the season. So instead of the even-paced 8-10 to 10 minute shorts every week or so that then collected together to fill out a movie-length season, you got a single 12-minute episode that ended up released over two weeks, which actually averaged out to less than five minutes of content per week. Why five? Well, each episode release has a half-minute intro and a half-minute outro to them. So for a series released over four to five months, it felt like there was little content there with each release, and made it difficult to care and stay invested, especially since season one ended up being the shortest of the seasons thus far. Amidst these split episodes, Season 1, Parts 5, 7, and 11 each had under 5 minutes of total runtime. So remove that minute of outro and intro, and the shortest of these was 3.5 minutes long. The four character trailers which were released to advertise the series, and are actually canon to the series as they're called back to in the show, were each longer than that. My net friends, who I discussed the series with back in the day, we're all in agreement on this point, that such was just plain ridiculous and unappealing. And it happened six times in the first season, where they just split an episode just to increase the number of parts to the story, and without those, season one is just ten parts long. No season since then, however, has ended up doing that or having that problem. The shortest episode past the first season being Volume three's ninth episode, which is just short of 12 minutes with the average release length increasing to 15 minutes per part, with far better pacing to events. And with a collection of story lore segments intersected between them, the seasons now even out to be about 12 to 14 parts running over the course of a quarter of a year. It should also be noted that the seasons read far better in the movie format provided by their home video releases than it has an episodic season. Then again, I've always felt Rooster Teeth series read better on the whole marathon or in their film collection format. This most highlighted by Red vs. Blue's 14th season that was an anthology of disconnected shorts, and caught a lot of flack for it. Viewing the series as a collection of five and six act movies certainly increases their rewatchability. Likewise, the powers and abilities in this setting are, well, rather ill-defined in the first season. Each hunter has two abilities, known as Aura and Semblance, which gives them unique powers and a natural defense against attacks and enemies. But exposition about that came way too late, and primarily in a lore primer not part of the core series, and there not being a good way to elaborate on it from the constructed story. First episode, Ruby's an acrobatic gunscythe wielder, and then there's a woman throwing fireballs, and another with spell constructs. With the introductory exposition drop about Dust being the spice that makes the universe work, it's easy to mistake that all for dust-based abilities. But then that ends up in disparity with Ruby's displays of extreme speed, and Yang showcase bursts of rage that make her stronger. Initially, Weiss's constructs were thought to be because of her dust, and not a unique ability of her own. And even later on, it's difficult to distinguish the two. These over time were revealed to be their unique powers, with Blake able to create illusionary clones of herself, pure magnetic powers, and so on. This all wasn't made clear until the second season, though, where there were several scenes which were made to elaborate on these facts and powers. And it took years for everyone's unique semblance to be introduced. And since then, the show has tried to be a bit better about the clarification between one person's unique power and what might come from a weapon or dust in Elysian Tale. What? My biggest issue with the first season on character front, though, was Weiss. Oh my god, I thought Weiss was a complete bitch when they introduced her, and there was nothing that changed my opinion of that for about two seasons of the show. 
a high society brat like that going to a school for monster hunters? Something was clearly wrong here as conduct like that shouldn't be seen from someone going into this kind of profession. How they fixed that, though, was by giving context to her upbringing and how her family are rather stifling and emotionally negligent to the point of being outright abusive. So much of this was simply emulating her familiar role models and it taking time for her to both open up to be herself and grasp that the doll her family wanted her to be isn't what the rest of the world, nor what she, wants. And intellectually, I did understand what they were doing with her and her feelings of loneliness and isolation because of her upbringing due to her character trailer being all about how alone she felt. But there was for the longest time a complete emotional disconnect with that direction due to how awful a person she could act like early on. You make it sound like I used to be terrible. Nah, just a lot to deal with at once. Or in short, they laid it on far too thick and had to backpedal to not make everything irreparable. I still hate her introduction, but now in the first two seasons, I see more of when the bitch ice cream persona broke to show what she actually felt and opened up to, instead of the persona of what was expected of the high society politics of her family's stature, even as the story itself framed her family as horrible with their conduct towards the populace and putting themselves and their interests before everyone else. I think the breaking point early on for me was when she acted like a racist towards the faunus around her, without context that her hatred was towards those who had attacked her family, and not those she knew, unawares at the time that Blake was a faunus, and also ignorant of the role her family had in radicalizing equal rights protesters into becoming terrorists through her family's actions. And her recompense by the season's end she offered not feeling as if it were enough, and not help that it felt like Blake was offering the apology to her instead of it being the other way around. While this is informed later by Blake's own guilt complex towards being involved with the White Fang as they were radicalizing themselves, and feeling as if she broke away from them too late to not be tarnished by the experience and feeling responsible for the evils they have since committed, well, in the moment, Weiss was the party more in the wrong, and she didn't know what she was talking about. And I never feel as if the show ever gave enough lip service to that to really settle it between them on screen. The most we have gotten since is Weiss as part of her character arc openly defying her father's malicious ideals to the point that she initially cut herself entirely from them, only to be forced back into his grasp and back into the role of the subservient doll, even as she endeavors to rebel and break free from that again. The refusal she has shown to go back to the way she was is why I'm not as harsh to her anymore, as she did wake up to the larger world around her instead of trying to bend the world to how she views it. That Rooster Teeth pounced on the need to remedy that flaw in her character fast and not exasperate it as other series I've called out have done is really one of the reasons I love their work. As while the characters don't really change in their dynamics, you really are able to see more of them. I remember getting to know Ruby and thinking, this girl is the embodiment of purity. After a while, I saw Weiss was defiance, and Yang was strength. And unfortunately, because the season only focuses on a few characters, half of the recurring cast felt as if they held little character. Yang and Blake getting seeds for their stories, but little forward thrust, and it taking until season 4 for Ren and Nora to have their own backstories explored albeit with extremely strong storytelling to that which informs all you need to know of why they acted how they did in the beginning, but they initially felt as more gimmick than persona. The same can be said of the final two characters introduced in the final arc of season one. Penny, who ultimately ended up a cipher for Ruby's personal realization of the cruelties of the world, and Sun Wukong, that's another faunus cast member that ends up acting as Blake's confidant, but otherwise has less of a character than the rest of the cast in the story to date. He's used to get Blake to open up about her backstory for the audience, but that as much feels as if it should have been something her teammates should have been the focus of. If it weren't for all the assistance in Volumes 4 onwards that he provides for the crew, his inclusion almost felt purposeless. Beyond these criticisms, though, there are a lot of otherwise good things and good ideas which for many allowed them to ride these poorer moments. The background music by Jeff Williams, Alex Abraham, and Steve Goldsheen are really good and accent every scene very well, though the lyrics for the songs leave much to be desired. Regardless, I feel all the volumes of the story thus far have done great in that respect. 
I also like the feeling of the mix of the rustic and advanced technologies. While I've critiqued other series for doing it, doing it with this series feels right in that only certain regions of the world have the safety to create advancements, but those advancements can easily be spread to the lands where advanced means of construction aren't as accessible, or otherwise in short supply thanks to the Grim. I'd figure any advancements in dealing with them would get around at the very least. Thus by proxy, I love how every weapon and tool feels unique and yet simultaneously effective, as if the cast have grown into using their tools for the most part. I really, really love Ruby's Gun Scythe Crescent Rose, and hope to actually add it to my list of things I've built someday. Well, it or the Scythe Shadowy Death. I could coin flip, honestly. And the Grim are legitimately intimidating. When the series is focused on fighting them, you see why are they such an ever-present threat and not just overblown or corrupted wildlife, backed up by revelations of their origins later in the series. And despite some things not being clear, when the story is actually focused on elaborating on something, it does flow together without conflict. Sometimes with it being seated before on the backdrop amidst other scenes that makes you aware that tensions are running higher than was normal, so something will happen sooner or later. Ruby and Yang as well as Nora and Ren clearly give off the feeling of being siblings and long-lasting friends respectively with how natural their interactions feel, which is a credit to the voice direction, even though as each of the actors were still finding their footing in the roles in the first season, their performances could come off a bit, well, flat. And both of these relationships are further built on as time moves on, Ren and Nora set having their strongest moments as part of season 4, whereas Season 2 begins expansion of Yang and her personal conflicts that draw her between two opposing goals, one of which will lead her away from the family she's known. But of the four main girls, honestly I feel my favorite is Blake simply because her life is complex, containing the experiences of both how harsh and how bright the world can be within her, having to make the hard decisions throughout her life, and resist giving to the temptation to take the easy and yet wrong decision. This shown clearly even early on, which was all the more important considering she is the linchpin tying together the entire arc about her race and the White Fang, and yet it's not done in a way that overshadows anyone, simply that connection haunting her with how it rears its head to affect those around her. And with hindsight of the series following seasons, however, several things do play differently than they once did. Before Season 2's introduction of Ruby and Yang's Dong Suai, dog-shaped images and props were regularly appearing in the series somewhat even foreshadowing his introduction. The chess pieces that were in the items the group needed to retrieve to pass their entrance exams to form their teams dectails well with the later revelation that they are all pawns in Ospin's own intricate plans. I've made more mistakes than any man, woman, and child on this planet. The growing civil unrest has a greater context to it, and even something as simple as a healing cut on John's cheek in episode 6 shows there was a greater intended purpose behind it. We just didn't realize what it meant until later, as it was that subtly introduced when the storytelling was more freeform. Honestly, it feels as if Monty never really left, and I don't mean to say that in the sense of he didn't have the involvement in the show people believed him to, but that Miles and Carrie and the rest of the crew are doing a good job on either following what he might have had planned out or brainstormed with them, mindful of prior critiques and reception of course, or otherwise gone back over the early material that had been completed and released to produce developments that seem natural and in retrospect obvious, to try and make something better than what they and the show started out as. Embarrassment? That desire to go back and tell yourself not to be so stupid? That just proves you're not the same person you used to be. And you're not done growing yet. None of us are. And as such, while the first season of Ruby isn't that good, it really isn't. I legitimately don't feel it worthy of really hating on as they learn from their mistakes. It certainly remains cringeworthy at times, but you know what? Now having watched season 3 through 6 and seen what was done after, and how much it made important, made matter, so many things laid out early, I regret dropping it when I did. For at the end of the day, Ruby Season 1 ended up just an extended prologue to the full thrust of the story, which took time to form, beginning at the connections of these bonds of people in preparation for the hardships they'd face, the complicated family, the lost friends they'd have to confront, and the true villain still out of sight, and as of Season 6, still far out of reach. The students at Beacon Academy still have a long way to go to reach the day they've been waiting for. Ruby is available for streaming and on home video from Rooster Teeth. Check in with the crew and see what you might have missed.